Although I realize Halloween uh, was a few days ago, I'm going to ask you this morning to think for a little bit about what you're afraid of. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that we fear. I mean, there are a lot of common fears that people have. There's, you know, fear of the dark, fear of snakes uh, that many people share, fear of spiders. Uh, I can't tell you how many times when I was a kid or when my kids were young, uh, I'd be sitting in the living room and suddenly I'd hear a blood curdling scream coming from my daughter's room and she'd start shouting that there was a giant spider in her room. So I'd go up there and I'd find this tiny little thing you pretty much needed a magnifying glass to see. <laughs> you know, fear tends to magnify things in our mind. And there are many people who, you know, we have a lot of those common fears. There are also a lot of sort of uh, unusual fears that, that people have. Um, I remember when my kids were young, I thought it would be a good idea to introduce them to the Muppets. That turned out to be a bad idea. Uh, all three of them were terrified of the Muppets. I still don't like watching anything with Muppets in it. I have no idea why. But, you know, there are many unusual fears that have even are, are, have become so significant that they've even been given names. Like xanthophobia, which is the fear of the color yellow. And in extreme case, I mean, there are people that are afraid of the color yellow, and in extreme cases of this, a person can even be overwhelmed by fear if somebody just mentions the word yellow without even seeing the color. There's turophobia, which is the fear of cheese. Uh, people have to run away if they see a slice of cheese. Uh, for some people, this is a fear of only specific types of cheese, but for others, it's, uh, it's any kind of cheese. Then there's paganophobia, which is the fear of beards. Omrophobia, which is the fear of rain. And then nomophobia, which is a fairly new fear that's arisen, but one that I think is going to very quickly uh, take over and become dominant for many people. And that is the fear of being without your cell phone. <laughs> now, if you think about your fears, you know, do your fears ever paralyze you? You know, there are a lot of fears that do that. You think about like agoraphobia, uh, the fear of wide open spaces, and people who are terrified to go outside. Uh, they're confined to their home, essentially imprisoned and paralyzed by their fear. Uh, I know I often been, you know, one of the, the fears that I've struggled with is a fear of heights, which is another fairly common one. Uh, I had it really, really bad <clears throat> uh, when I was younger, and I remember, you know, being a kid at the local swimming pool, and looking at the high dive there. And you know, when you look at the high dive from the ground, it doesn't look that high. And so I decided for the first time I was gonna jump off the high dive. Uh, so I climbed up the ladder, and, you know, I walked out to the edge and I looked down to the pool and my body just froze. And, you know, I, I couldn't go forward, I couldn't jump, it was just, I was just paralyzed. And so I had to do the walk of shame and turn around, <laughs> go back and try to pass everybody on the ladder climbing down. Or when, even when I was older, when I was in high school, uh, our local mall had uh, kind of an indoor amusement park attached to it that had a, a second floor uh, kind of high up. And I wanted to go up to the second floor one day. And they had a, the, the way to get up was a staircase that, that went up, and then there was a landing, and then it went up again, and another landing, and then it went up uh, to the second floor. And I decided I was going to go up. Uh, the problem was the steps didn't have backs behind them. So like as you're climbing, you can see through. And I made it up to the first landing, no problem. And then I turned and started to make my way up to the second landing, and I got halfway up, and again, my body just froze. I was just sort of paralyzed. I couldn't, take, couldn't get my legs to take another step uh, forward. And that's what fear can do. You know, fear can be paralyzing and keep us from acting. It can stop our movement. You know, that's why we even, we even use the term frozen in fear. Well, if you're wondering why I'm talking about this this morning, it's because I want to talk some about the Gospel of Mark, and fear is a major theme in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, it's a term that shows up many, many times in the Gospel of Mark. I think it's probably more prominent in the Gospel of Mark as a theme than any of the other Gospels. And if you think about what's thought to be the context in which Mark was written, it makes a lot of sense. The Gospel of Mark was thought to have been written to the Church of Rome. And it's thought to have been written probably in the mid to late 60s in Rome. And if you know much about what was going on in Rome at that time, it was not an easy time for the church. Uh, a little bit earlier, around the year 64 AD, uh, there was a fire that broke out in the city of Rome that burned a section of the city. 
And a rumor quickly started circulating that the emperor at that time, the emperor Nero, was behind the fire. And this was because Nero had not made much of a secret out of the fact that he had wanted to rebuild a portion of the city kind of in his own image. And you know, he had all these plans for this building that he wanted to do. The problem was that Rome had pretty much taken up all of its available space already. And it just so happened that the section of the city that burned to the ground was the section Nero wanted to rebuild. And so the rumor began to circulate that Nero was behind this himself. Well, what tends to happen when politicians find themselves you know, on the receiving end of a scandal like that is they tend to cover things up and deflect blame. And so what Nero did is he decided to pin the fire on a group of people in Rome that everybody hated anyway. So he knew people would buy it, go along with it, and that was the Christians. And so he accused the Christians of being behind this fire in Rome, and then he instituted a great persecution against them as a result of it. And as the result of that, many Christians uh, suffered, uh, many of them died for their faith. And you know, in that kind of context where your, your friends, your family, even yourself, you're being arrested, you're being threatened, you're being tortured, and even put to death. You know, in a context like that, and, and, and the Gospel of Mark, again, is thought to have been written uh, shortly after these events. You know, Jesus' statement in Mark chapter 8, where he says, take up your cross and follow me, kind of takes on new meaning in that context. Because in Mark chapter 8, you know, Jesus it starts this off by saying, you know, I am the Christ. You know, he acknowledges Peter's confession of him. And then he goes on to explain what being the Christ means. And he says it means to suffer, be rejected, and die. Well, if that's what being the Christ means, what does it mean to be a disciple of the Christ? You know, what does it mean to follow such a person? And the answer in the Gospel of Mark, it means to do the same thing that Jesus did, to be willing to suffer and be rejected and die. But you know, in our culture today, uh, we hear the words, take up your cross, and we tend to think of them a lot of times metaphorically. You know, take up your cross means to just be obedient, try to be faithful to God. Maybe if there's something in my life that, you know, shouldn't be in my life, I sacrifice it, get rid of it. But for the people to whom the Gospel of Mark was written, that statement was far more literal. You know, their following Christ could literally mean their suffering and death. And I think in America, we don't have a, much of a context for understanding this, you know, because despite what we may think, we really experience little to no suffering for our faith in America. You know, the majority of the suffering we experience tends to be secular. You know, we suffer from illnesses or financial problems or relationship struggles. And yes, you know, occasionally Christians might get ridiculed in the media or maybe a co-worker will say something mean to you. But to be put in physical danger because of our faith is extremely rare. And that can lead us to a, a distorted view sometimes, I think. You know, that because this is our experience of Christianity, we tend to assume it's the same way for Christians everywhere. But if you consider North Korea, uh, there's some interesting, if you think about Christianity in North Korea, there's some interesting things going on there. Uh, one thing that people, maybe many people perhaps are not aware of is from the late 19th century up until the Korean War, Korea was a stronghold of Christianity. In fact, the capital city uh, of Pyongyang was called the Jerusalem of the East uh, because of the strong presence of Christianity there. Of course, today the situation's a bit different. Uh, for the last, I don't know, 18 to 20 years or so, uh, North Korea has ranked as the most oppressive place in the world for Christians. In fact, Jeff King, who's uh, president of the International Christian Concern Organization, says that in North Korea, Christians are accused of being imperialists, seeking to overthrow the government, and those who are caught practicing their faith are arrested horrendously tortured, imprisoned, and sometimes immediately put to death. And you know, North Korea is a country that uh, you know, tends to present one face to the world while trying to hide the truth. And certainly this is true with respect to Christianity, because on the surface, Christianity is accepted in North Korea. Uh, their constitution vows religious freedom and it vows to forbid discrimination on faith. 
And in the capital city, they have five uh, state-controlled churches. However, those churches are basically just showpieces. Uh, they're basically there for when visiting dignitaries come or tourists come through, and then they load the churches with state-chosen workers uh, to go sort of go through religious rituals to basically put on a show. Whereas the reality is very different. Uh, in North Korea, being a Christian is a life-threatening choice. And they live in constant fear and paranoia. In fact, there was one uh, a story told about one little girl named Yoon, who was in third grade. And in her third grade class one day, the teacher gave them a special assignment. She said to all of the class, all of the students there that she wanted them to go home and search their house and see if they could find a certain book. And if they found that book, they were to come back and tell the teacher, and they would be rewarded and honored at school that day. Well, the book they were to look for was the Bible. And so you went home and she searched her parents' house and she found the Bible. And so she came to school the next day and told her teacher about it. And indeed, she was rewarded and honored at school that day. However, after school, when she went home, her parents were no longer there. And in fact, North Korea not only arrests Christians, but even their relatives, whether they're Christian or not, sometimes up to the third generation. And it's been estimated that about 70,000 Christians are living in North Korean concentration camps. And usually only about 75% of those do not survive. And there are stories told of Christians being crushed by steamrollers, uh, used to test biological weapons, or being hung on crosses over an open fire. You know, these Christians know what it means to take up your cross. And in the Gospel of Mark, again, the Christians to whom this Gospel is written had a similar experience. I mean, they had gone through a time of great suffering. You know, they had had loved ones and relatives arrested and died for their faith. And the persecution by Nero was notoriously violent. Christians could be torn to death by wild animals or they were crucified on crosses and hung, hung by the street and set on fire to serve as illumination at nighttime. What would eventually happen, Neil's persecution fortunately didn't last that long because he went so overboard in persecuting these Christians that eventually the public sentiment turned against him. And even though people in Rome had no love for Christians, uh, it was thought that Nero became so gluttonous in his punishment of, of them that people started to feel sorry for the Christians. And once Nero realized that public sentiment was turning against him, he ended the persecution. And the Gospel of Mark, again, is thought to have been written probably just a couple, two or three years after this persecution ended. And it would have been a time of great fear because they would have known that if this could happen once, it could easily happen again. Uh, at any moment, their lives could be in danger. And that, I think, helps us make sense of much of what happens in the Gospel of Mark and this theme of fear that he develops in this Gospel. In fact, the first place it starts to show up is in chapters 4 through 6, uh, where Mark groups four stories together, all of which have a theme of fear to them. The first comes at the end of chapter 4, uh, the story where Jesus calms the storm. You know, he's out on the boat with his disciples, and a great storm arises, and the disciples are terrified because of this storm. And if you think about that by itself, that suggests this must have been a pretty major storm, considering that many of the disciples were fishermen themselves. They had been through many storms, and so the, the extent to which this storm terrifies them uh, indicates it must have been pretty severe. And yet, in contrast to their terror, Jesus' actions is a stark contrast, as he is sleeping peacefully. But the disciples become paralyzed by their fear. And so as they wake Jesus up in chapter 4, verses 39 to 40, it says, He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Well, then immediately after that story, they cross over in the boat to the area of Gerasa. And as soon as they get there, they encounter a man who's possessed by multiple demons. And Jesus exercises the demons from the man and, and sends them into a herd of pigs uh, who then uh, run down the hill and are drowned in the lake. 
Well, after this, you know, that, that's good news for the, the man who was possessed by these demons. It's not such good news for the swine herds, you know, the people who were in charge of these swine. Uh, Jesus has just destroyed their livelihood. And so they run off, and they go to the town, and they tell all the people in the town what has just happened. And in Mark chapter 5, uh, verses 15 to 17, it says, When the people from the town came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. Right, so in these two stories, we've progressed from fear of the sea to fear of Jesus himself. You know, they're terrified at the power that they witness and the damage that that power can do to their very livelihoods. Well, then the next two stories that follow immediately after uh, are the story of Jairus and his daughter and the woman with the hemorrhage. Uh, two stories back to back about women in jeopardy, two people in desperation. And the first is a man named Jairus who has a 12-year-old daughter, sick and at the point of death. And as you can imagine, he was terrified. You know, there's no worse fear for a parent than to have their child in danger. And yet his 12-year-old daughter is dying. And then we're introduced to a woman who's also been living in terror. Uh, for 12 years, she's been struggling with an illness and she's spent all of her money. She's done everything she can to find relief and has been unable to. And so she's desperate and at her wit's end. And so in an act of desperation, she reaches out and touches Jesus' cloak and is miraculously healed. But then when Jesus turns and asks, who touched me? We're told in verse 33, then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. Well, then Jesus continues on to Jairus' house where they are informed that Jairus' daughter has in fact died. Verse 35, while Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. And so here we have four stories in a row, each one developing this theme of fear. And in each of these stories, we see people struggling with their fear, Jesus continually counseling them to not be afraid, but only believe. And if you think about the message of these stories together, you know, the first story, the calming of the storm, shows that Jesus has power over nature. The second story, where he cast out a demon, shows that Jesus has power over the supernatural world as well. And then the next story shows as he uh, heals this woman that he has power over sickness. And then finally, when he raises Jairus' daughter to life, shows that he has power over death. Well, if you think about that, if you take all of that together, the natural world, the supernatural world, sickness and death, what's left? Pretty much nothing. These four stories together display Jesus' power over pretty much everything. And it raises the question, why are these people so afraid? You know, why are you so afraid if your Lord has power over everything? Well, then we come to chapter 6, and we get another story taking place on the water, where the disciples again are out on the boat, and Jesus comes walking to them out on the water, and they think he's a ghost, and once again, they are terrified. You know, they didn't learn their lesson from the calming of the storm. They're still letting themselves be governed by fear. And so in verse 49, it says, When they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. You know, this is the second time now he said that in two chapters. And that kind of encapsulates part of the message of Mark. Don't be afraid. Because all throughout this gospel, people are paralyzed by their fear. And that, faith, that fear leads to inaction. It leads to paralysis. And if you think about it in today's context, you know, fear does the same thing. 
You know, fear can paralyze us from being active in the kingdom of God. You know, maybe, you know, fear can paralyze us to keep us from being active in evangelism as we're afraid of being rejected. You know, I remember when I was a, a sophomore in college, I went on a mission trip uh, for six weeks to Australia. And this was back, you know, in the 80s where door knocking was still kind of a big thing. That, that's kind of how you did evangelism in those contexts. So I went there knowing I was going to have to go around and knock on the doors of complete strangers and try to talk to them about Jesus. And I was terrified of doing that. Uh, I was a very shy, kind of introverted kid, and, and the thought of doing that just, just really filled me with fear. And I remember the first day going out to do this, they paired me with one other uh, student, so the two of us were going out together, and he had done this before, and so he kind of took the lead for the first number of houses, and then finally he said, well, why don't you take the lead this time? And so I went up to the first house where I was going to be the one uh, initiating, and didn't have to knock on the door because there was a guy out there in his garage. So we went up and just started uh, talking to the guy uh, in his garage, and then he started screaming at us, you know, told us to get out, uh, didn't want anything to do with it. Well, as you can imagine, that made it a lot harder to go to the next door. Uh, you know, that's what fear does. It just kind of paralyzes us. Or maybe you found yourself, you know, struggling with inviting neighbors to church uh, because you're afraid that if they say no, it becomes a lot more awkward when you pass them on the street next time. Or fear might keep us from engaging in speaking opportunities, whether it's, you know, preaching a sermon or teaching a Bible class or holding a Bible study. You know, we're afraid that we won't be good enough, that we don't know enough. Fear can keep us from praying with someone we don't know for fear of having to become vulnerable. You know, maybe fear keeps you from helping a homeless person on the street because you're afraid of being deceived by them or afraid of wasting resources. Or fear can keep us from getting more involved in church as we're afraid of the demands that it might put on our time, on our life. Or maybe we fear that we're just not a good enough Christian. Now, that's what fear does. It paralyzes us and keeps, keeps us from fulfilling the mission that Christ calls us to. And throughout the Gospel of Mark, that's what we see happening. We see fear consistently leading to a lack of discipleship. You know, the disciples fail in their discipleship when they fear during the storm when they see Jesus walking on the water to them. And even as you get towards the end of the story, when Jesus is in the garden and the soldiers come to arrest him, what do the disciples do? They abandon him in fear. In fact, Mark even tells us in chapter 14 about one disciple who was so afraid and so desperate to get away with Jesus that he wiggles out of his clothes when they grab him and runs away naked. You know, again, discipleship fails in the midst of fear. Well, fear then leads Peter to deny Jesus three times. And as Jesus is hanging on the cross, fear causes his, all of his disciples to abandon him there. But surely we might think the resurrection changes everything. You know, once Jesus rises from that tomb, then surely their fear will be abandoned. Well, not in the Gospel of Mark. In Mark's version of the resurrection story, in chapter 16, he talks about the women coming to the tomb, bringing uh, spices to anoint the body. When they get to the tomb, they find that the stone has already been rolled away. And as they look in it, they see a young man sitting there. And the young man speaks to them. Verse 6, he says, Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. All right, so notice they come to the tomb, this man encounters them, this man tells them that Jesus has been raised and tells them to go and tell everybody about this. But then we're told in verse 8, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. You know, again, they were afraid, and because of that, their discipleship fails. They tell nothing to anyone. So Mark has developed this theme of fear throughout his gospel, where the disciples repeatedly fail. And that makes sense when you understand that the community and the churches to which he's writing are living through a context where they are in danger of failing out of fear. 
that if persecution rises again when these dangers and these threats face them, uh, their, faith, their, faith, or their faith and their discipleship may once again fail. Now, why would Mark tell the resurrection story this way? I mean, it's different than all the other gospel writers do. All the other gospel writers immediately talk about Jesus appearing to people and the disciples going out and telling everybody. But in Mark's gospel, the first thing we're told is the disciples, these women, say nothing to anyone out of fear. And I think part of that is because Mark wants us, as the readers of this gospel, as the people hearing this story, to put ourselves in their place. Essentially, what Mark is saying to his audience is, what are you going to do? You know, you know that Jesus has been raised, and you also have been told to go out and tell everyone. But are you also going to fail out of fear? Are you going to let fear paralyze you and say nothing to anyone? You know, again, twice in this gospel, Jesus tells the disciples, do not be afraid. And when they fail to hear those or fail to heed those words, their discipleship, their action fails. But the opposite is also true. When we do heed that command, that's when the church and the kingdom grows. In fact, to go back to North Korea for a second, you know, I talked about the challenges that the Christians in North Korea face. And yet, despite all of the fear and the danger they face, it's been estimated that about 36% of the population of North Korea are Christians, uh, roughly about 9 million people. Uh, these Christians gather together in the dark, hiding in the back rooms of houses. They can only whisper their prayers and their hymns for fear of being overheard. Their Bibles, they, they rip out the pages of their Bibles and scatter them and hide them in different places. And yet through all of that, they follow Jesus. You know, Jesus' words would resonate with them. Do not be afraid. In fact, Vernon Brewer, uh, founder of World Hell, says, despite efforts to eradicate Christians, we have found the church in North Korea is actually growing. They know that only God is powerful enough to break through the darkness of the most, impressive, most oppressive regime on earth. Now that's the challenge that Mark lays in front of us. Throughout this gospel, people fail in their faith out of fear. And yet Jesus counsels us to not be afraid. And of course, that's easier said than done. You know, I think fear comes natural to us, but belief can be a challenge. And yet Jesus tells us to not be afraid because he can calm the storms of our lives. You know, Jesus tells us to not be afraid because he can exercise our demons. Jesus tells us not to be afraid because he can heal our illnesses and our hurts. And he tells us not to be afraid above all because he came out of that tomb. And so this morning as I close, uh, I just want to caution you or, or admonish or give you the admonition that, you know, if fear has been ruling your life, uh, you can turn that over to Jesus. And I leave you with the words of Jesus this morning, which also I think do a good job of capturing the message of the Gospel of Mark, which is do not fear, only believe. 